Live, testing, testing, we're good. You guys hear me okay? All right. Well, thank you, Pastor, for that awesome introduction. Um, I mimic the same sentiments with regard to you. Um, as Pastor mentioned, I was out in New York a few years ago working after graduating at Columbia, doing life out there. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd ever leave the state of Washington, let alone be out in New York. God works in amazing ways. Not only that, but to see my old, I don't know, youth group pastor on Facebook with countenance talking about the Holy Spirit as if he was right here next to him. You know, this is the, exactly. Thank, you guys have more faith than so many people I encounter all the time. I mean, in this countenance, this Holy Spirit is, I'm sure, what spoke to me and drew me into him. Because I'm like, so many people say they believe something, whether it's philosophy or politics or faith or whatever, and they just simply do not live it. You can analyze everything they do and they do not believe it. And it kills your confidence in what they're saying because they're not even believing it. So when you could see it in his heart and you knew it was real, it wasn't him trying to be authentic, it was the Holy Spirit moving in him. And I think every one of you guys recognize this in our pastor and that's what sets it apart and that's why we're here. And yes, I do come up from Edmond. Some people ask me, why would you go so far? You know, why don't you just find a church? nearby. Uh, convenience was never what you're called to do in the Bible. I, I didn't think that's what it was. And granted, you certainly, I could find camaraderie in a place, I'm sure I could, that's closer, but that's not my prime agenda right now, you know. My agenda is growing, it's uh, being, being, how do you say, just being around believers, people that are living this, walking this, supporting each other in a genuine way. And it's hard to find even within the church community, around, I've seen it. And uh, here it's genuine. So that's why I come up here, you know. I need it as much as I hope to give. So thank you guys all for that. Um, and also thank you guys, everyone that spoke, all the ladies that came up and just shared that testimony is just so awesome for every one of us here. It's edifying. Because you're showing us different facets of the Holy Spirit. And it mimics in our heart. Because one person can't know God in its entirety. He's God, man. We're like dust, right? So we have to reflect into one another and say, Whoa, that's God too. Whoa, he does that? Oh my God, big, small, everything. And it's never ending. It's never amazing. It's going to continue being this the more we know him for all eternity. And that, that's exciting stuff, guys. It really is. I'm not doing it justice because I'm nervous, but I'll pray for the boldness that you said to come out. Um, so thank you guys for just doing that. It's so awesome for your faith. You made the Holy Spirit alive to yourself and to us. And maybe some of us are down or didn't get a God shot last week and feel a bit distant. But when we come in here and hear that, we're like, oh, we feel that hand on our shoulder and we say, you're real. And even if it's not through me directly, through you guys, I'm getting that channel. So that's why it's important to be connected. That's so awesome. And so a uh, rather long introduction. I'll ask that uh, we all bow our heads in prayer. Ah, God, we come before you. We picture you on your throne in heaven as much as we can, Father, in awe, bowing down in glory and majesty of, of all that you are. Goodness, power, majesty, holiness in ways that we can never even comprehend, Father. Ah, oh, there's so much we don't know, Father, and we tremble at your word, but we gather and we're gathered today because we believe in you, Father. We believe in what you said. Your truth resonates with us. We've seen it in our hearts and in our experience of life, and we can't, we can't walk away from it, so we're here, Father. We ask that you meet us here, Lord God. Reveal yourself to our hearts in a new way. Indelibly change us. Make us not have to wonder if it happened, Father. Make a mark be on our lives that people see and that smells of you, Father, and, and reflects them to you. Uh, bless this sermon to all of us and to me. Get me out of it. Uh, would you use my mouth to say what you want? Uh, amen. Okay, so interesting topic. Today is going to be called, top, today's topic is going to be called Boasting in the Lord. Can you say boasting? Boasting. I can't hear you back there, Perry. Boasting. I boasted before of you, Perry. You're a good looking guy. You boasted. I know you have. Yes, sir. It's all right. One to another. So here we go. Uh, so I looked up the definition because I thought boasting's bad, right? We're always raised boasting's bad. In the church and our parents, it's about pride, comparison. It's not good. Yeah, it's excessively proud and self satisfied talk about one's achievements, possessions, or abilities. It's generally about temporal things, things that pass quickly, whether it be your youth, your finances, your beauty. Uh, LeBron James' amazing basketball skills, he's worshipped, he's untouchable. But in 30 years' time, who's going to worship those skills? They're gone. Right. What's the point? There's no lasting value in it. 
five generations won't care who LeBron James was. There's no glory in it. Very, very transient, very quick. So we know it's bad to do. Uh, generally, people that boast have a lack of sense of self, right? They're insecure. We know this in ourselves when we boast. It's because we feel weak and we want to feel better than this guy. So I'm better looking than you. I'm skinnier than you. I have more money than you. I'm not that race. I'm this race. I'm not that sex. I'm this. So it's always just trying to compare. It's rooted in a lack of understanding in who we are to God, essentially. And we're trying to fill this somehow and in non-healthy ways. The funny thing is, in Jeremiah 23 and 24, God actually tells us to boast. Yes, kind of weird, right? I thought boasting was bad. Maybe not always. Maybe it's like sex. Sex can be evil and malicious and burn a house down. But within the bounds of marriage, it's one of the greatest gifts God's ever given to man. Two ways to look at it, right? So this is what the Lord says in Jeremiah 23, or 9, 23 and 24. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, nor the strong man in his strength, nor the wealthy man in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Come on. The God of the universe is saying that you can know him. That should blow your mind. Or it's insane. One of the two. But it can't be the middle ground. Oh, I can no oh, okay, it's fine. I want to play video games. You, know, it's, 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 you, can't, you can't treat it with a middle ground. It's either exceptionally amazing or it's nuts and insane. So let's, let's take a break and unpack this. This is quite, quite transcendent, quite radical. The Bible says that in order to be pure, we don't want to be prideful. We don't want to be haughty. Uh, we don't want to be boasting. Uh, but we know why we boast, right? When we boast, it's because we're super stoked about something. Super excited, super proud. We can't help but let it just come out of us. Uh, you creamed that guy in the boxing match. You beat the hell out of him. You're excited. You did well. You prepped. And you, we all know what it's like to be beaming with pride and joy and exuberance and whatever it is we're, we're proud about, right? Um, and not only that, but God doesn't say we can feel this uh, in knowing God, but we're commanded to know God to the point that we feel this, to the point that we're boasting in God. That to me is an amazing promise because I'm not there. I don't boast about my understanding of God constantly. I know some people that do. Um, I'll talk about God, but to boast with absolute confidence in who he is and what he does for you, that's our inheritance. That's where we can be. And that to me is incredibly joyful you know we get to look forward to this this is the joy that's not predicated on the materials that go it's not predicated on the money that goes it's predicated on something robust god the creator of the universe that should make us happy right and it, don't get me wrong we're, we're human beings we're dying I, we're not the smartest it can be hard to take in i mean this is this is some hard level theology and it's much easier just to you know like drink a beer and just say well there's nothing more in life watch tv it's easy um, but god will equip us in power and in strength and it will strengthen us to grow in this maturity to lead the world in these realizations it's it's our calling um, so then right i think you guys would agree with me god is worth boasting over it's pretty exciting his promises yes. so why aren't us why aren't i why aren't you perry why aren't you boasting more about our knowledge of god to those around us I, I mean, I know I don't, you know, so I just didn't think about this. You know, we're all adults. It's not fun to look at yourself in mirrors, but <laughs> we need to, right? And that's how we teach kids to do it, because we need to do it. And uh, I like philosophizing about God. I like talking esoterically about it, what he does, how he moves in my life. I really enjoy it. But I don't boast. I don't excitedly tell people and shout and say, my God is so good, he does this. What does your God do? What is your outlook? What does your worldview do for you? I want to tell you about mine. And let's see which wins. What makes more sense? We hear people talk about their politics all the time. We listen to them. Oh, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. Oh, morally, they shouldn't do this. Blah, blah. People preach all the time. You know, and we can and should do this with God more confidently, more convictedly, and more robustly, and we can do that. Um, I have four sisters. I love them to death. Oh, no, I don't love them to death. I would say 
I'm thankful to God for giving them to me to develop my patience, I would say. He has done that. But um, I have this one I work with in real estate. She's my oldest sister. She's wonderful. She's almost like half a mother. Uh, she kind of raised us when my mom was out of the picture as a kid. But anyway, we, we do this thing where she's like fully established in real estate, has been for like six, seven years, doing great financially. I quit my job as a consultant in New York because I speak Chinese. We had this plan to go in together, lots of unknown. And it hasn't been, let's just say, the, the most robust, consistently financially awesome choice I've ever made, but I don't regret it either. I think it was an awesome time to boost my faith, boost my relationship with her, try new things, and it's been the hardest time in my life, but been the most growth-oriented in my life, too. So I can't say it wasn't God's uh, idea or that it wasn't good. But, sorry, tangent. The point is, whenever we're at a business meeting with my sister or something, she knows I'm not quite as awesome as she is, and I'm still learning. And out of her love and her passion for me, her little brother, which is touching, because I, I don't care about her at all nearly as much. Seriously, she's amazing. And she will tell people, Oh my God, Ryan's so amazing. You don't know he helps in real estate. He speaks Mandarin Chinese, blah, blah, blah. He went to this school. He's traveled the world. He's interned with Department of State. Blah, blah. Sorry, I'm not trying to. I'm just saying. She lists all these things. Then people come up to me and they know my whole MO. And they're like, oh my God, Ryan, you preach at a church? And I'm like, what? I haven't even talked to you before. Oh my, your sister said you're a preacher now. What's, what's going to tell her? How long does it take for you to prep? And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this is my sister boasting about me, you know? And it's annoying on one hand, but it's supremely touching because she's going out of her way. She can't help it almost. I've asked her not to. She can't help it. It just shows us a little bit about boasting. What does it mean? Uh, she didn't need to rehearse what she was saying to those people about me. She already knew what she was going to say. Why? Because she's thinking about it all the time. She's concerned about me. What's Ryan doing? How's he doing? He's really good at this. He's good at this. He kind of screwed up on there, but I know he's going to be good. I'll help him with that. Very positive, you know? And this is, I think, kind of in the sense how we can be with God. If we knew him enough, if we thought about him enough, if we were smitten by his promises and really actually believed them tangibly enough in our hearts, we would be able to talk about God like that to people. And I know I'm not there, but we can get there. And it's our path, every one of us, you know? It's all about maturing. It's all about, or even like, like as kids, like if you're a kid, you, you would eat peanut, or no, if you're a kid, you probably just eat a bag of sugar, right? You probably would, you love it, it's, it tastes great. You would fight your mom, that's all I want, that's all I make me happy, mom. Okay, here's your bag of sugar. You're gonna get sick. You're not gonna be happy. And it takes time to realize that good food is actually not the most palatable at the beginning. It takes time, it takes maturation. It takes wisdom to know what good fruit is versus crappy fruit, you know, and what's going to give you nourishment versus what's going to detract from you. Um, it takes wisdom, it takes humility with God to say, oh, I shouldn't have bit that fruit. It kind of tastes like poo poo. And I'm like, don't do that again. Don't do it again. And that's okay. <laughs> give yourself some grace. You know, we're all children in his eyes, stumbling, trying to figure this out, you know, <laughs> leaning on him and figuring it out in a fallen world. It's, it's difficult. That's why we got each other, though. It's good. Um, so when I was thinking about, for me, it's like, if I can't, you guys have heard the term from the hip, shooting from the hip. It just means like, if you cannot plan it and just hit something, it means you're pretty good. So if I can't boast about Jesus cleanly, confidently to a stranger from the hip, I'm leaving something on the table with my relationship with God. He promises explicitly what we can have in Him. And if I look at that, read it, understand it, and turn away, I think that's a problem on me, not on God. And that, that struck me hard because it, I'm just talking to God about this, and He's like, well, you read it, and you saw it. Did you not understand it? Was it confusing? Uh, or are you just lazy and prone to wander? You know, is that, that's probably it. So that hurt, you know, and I'm not saying it to hurt you guys. I'm saying we're all humans in the sense. We're all lazy. Just by nature, it's hard. You know, we need God's grace even to keep going on a daily basis. So, you know, I'm not saying this to hurt you. I'm saying this to inspire you guys of how much closer and how much more fulfilling your walk can be because it's promised in the Word. It's promised in the Word. Look at Paul. Paul was either on some crazy drug or he was filled with the Holy Spirit in the way we all could and would want to be, I think. Exactly. Right? That's what I'm saying. Never come down from that high. That's what I'm saying, right? So, uh, there you go. So, so, as we're all Christians here, we're all brothers and sisters, we're all called, we're all empowered, and we're all emboldened to preach about what we're most passionate about. And right now, I think I can say it's not God for every one of us. It's not always God for me. But what's exciting is that it can be. 
yeah. God can be this for you. For the longest time, it's like, oh, God's just this thing I do on Sunday. No, 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 no. He can be as real as you want him to be. That's what the Bible says. So what do you want? Do you want to take the blue pill or the red pill? What matrix do you want to go back or do you want to go forward? Just don't stay in the middle. It's a bad place to be. It's really weird. That's where the worst judgment is, too. It's almost better to just say, no, God, go this way, or yes. But to hear him, consider him, and then eh, be indifferent, that's tantamount to like flipping him off. I mean, no offense. That's, I hear your offer. I see it. You're going to make someone else happy one day, but not me. I mean, that's, just realize that's what you're calling to God after you read the Bible and you see it. He's going to hold us accountable for that. I, I, whew, that's heavy. So, uh, so the good thing is about this, when I was thinking about being joyful and, uh, you know, how do you say, boasting in the Lord, being high on God all the time, I looked back to my life and I was like, I certainly wasn't always that way. And it made me mad, you know? Uh, I used to think I wasn't able to govern my thoughts uh, or emotions. And by that, I just mean, I think about a kid, you have a crush on someone, she broke up with you, so they made fun of you. You're just dwelling in this angst. And, and you might be able to, you know, maybe when you're older, a pastor might say, hey, but you have the creator of the universe in your heart. Shouldn't the fact that Jimmy doesn't like you not bother you? Yes, it should, but at 13 it's hard to rationalize that way, and you're often led by your emotions and your understanding, it's very hard. Um, but I think I was really angry with God because I was like, you, you command people to be joyful? I feel like I'm just a sourpuss. I'm grumpy, and I'm not grateful, and I want to be, and I see I should be. Why am I not? And there was a lot of frustration I had towards God that I voiced to him, you know? Why'd you make me a grumpy old man right now? I'm not a grumpy old man yet, but I feel like one. Um, <laughs> And I think God showed me that I often don't have the joy simply because I chose not to have the joy. Yeah. And that, again, made me mad. I'm like, it wasn't my choice. You did it to me. You know, I thought, ah, why would I choose that? And I, I think it's because I just disobeyed what the Bible said clearly and explicitly. It says, um, you can choose to dwell on God's provision. You can choose to dwell on godly things. You can choose to dwell on what he did for you. You can choose to dwell on his character. You can choose that. You can. Does it take work? Yes. Is it tiring? Yes. Is it easy? Not always. Sometimes it is. Is it like anything else in life that we have to sacrifice and work for the way he's taught us? Absolutely. It doesn't change with God. You still have to work. You set your sights on it. You see the value, and you work towards it. Not that you. It's not that it's works that you're saved by this, but God. God demands a heart that's trite, that wants Him, that will sacrifice, that will go for Him. It's honored all over the Bible with Caleb and Joshua, people that put God first and took Him on His promises and ran through it with confidence. This is what honors God. This is what makes Him say, "Ooh, this guy's got it. I like this right here." Um, so really, if I was dwelling on my problems, what do I expect to get? Joy from dwelling on my problems? No, you get joy from dwelling on God. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really it. So I challenge all of you guys, and all your friends, and all the, all the Christians, all the brotherhood around here, what if the church holistically really acted and worshipped what we were supposed to, not our problems? If we really worshipped God with fervent passion over our problems, if we really talked to our friends more about how exceptionally God has been awesome in their lives as opposed to a fight you had with your spouse. If we took precedence and believed life is an opportunity to do this, it may be something like that. It very well could be. Um, you read in the Bible, hey, if you're commanded to be joyful all the time, well, it's certainly not impossible then. It may not seem so at the time. It may not feel like it, but so are lots of things that your parents told you that you needed to do when you were a kid, but you swore you couldn't do. Take out the trash, be nice to your sister, whatever. You can do it, even if you don't feel like it is. Um, and we, is it to say life isn't hard? There's no pain or disappointments or sadness in life? Of course not. No, 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 we all have challenges. Every one of us, every one of us in this room has horrific challenges if we wanted to talk about it. Pains, disappointments, frustrations, doubts, anxieties that people will never know or maybe they'll know exactly what you mean. Um, and we will always have these. People with money have problems. People without money have problems. People with a loved one, a spouse, have problems. People without spouses have problems. Um, if it's not you, it's your parents. If it's not your parents, it's your kids. If it's not your kids, it's their grades or their significant other or sports or college or internships, your retirement, and ultimately your death and where your soul is going to go. So, so life is full of these things. These are not accidents. These are ordained and directed by God. And we get to learn how to walk with them with the instructions we're given in the Bible. So, 
I say that to implore you, don't make an excuse that I just can't be joyful. I'm just not like Susie Joyful over there. She's just got the gift of joy and I don't. No, I don't think that's the problem at all. Um, I think perspective is everything in life and I think we all can agree, right? If I told you all you guys said you have to stay in a hotel for six months and I bring you to a room, I open up the door and it's a prison cell. You know, there's wetness on the ground, there's chains, there's no cloths on the bed, it smells, and there's a pile of poop in the corner. This is your hotel for six months. You're going to be, what the hell? What? Okay, so same room. What if I walked in with you and said, hey guys, oh wait, no. Oh, I think I'm messing this up. In the, oh no, this is not. No breakdown, no breakdown here. I think I'm messing up the joke. The point is, if there's a jail cell and you tell someone it's going to be a honeymoon suite, they're going to be disappointed. Right? But if there's a honeymoon suite and you tell someone that they're going to prison for six months and you open up the door and you have the honeymoon suite there, the perspective in what you, what, how do you say, what you look to see is entirely influenced by the base of what's in your heart, by your perspective. And uh, how do you say, having joy is not saying to these horrific things in life like cancer or death or joblessness or insecurity. Oh, these are great, fun challenges. Life is great. That would be called insanity. We're not, we're not insane as Christians, you know. Uh, God gave us a sound mind. But looking at who God is and truly believing that every single life challenge, every single stressful opportunity, every single thing that takes your breath and you've got to step back and say, God, again. Every single one, every one, was a God-oriented obstacle on your path. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an accident. And it was for your own good and development. And this can't really be cultivated just by self-help, in my experience. It's got to be cultivated by God. It's got to, you got to be inviting him to avenge your heart and say, hey, change this heart. Help me to understand and perceive that, in fact, these challenges in my life were specifically ordained and called for my, my life purpose here. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Come on. And how do you say, uh, it's like a storm. A storm, billowing winds blowing at you. If you're standing in it, right, you just get beat up. I just want to complain. It sucks. It's not fun to be out there, right? But we all know, is a storm or a wind inherently bad? Is there something evil about a storm? No, only when it's... It's just pressure, just wind. It's just normal. It happens all the time. No wind is the same as wind on the earth. It just moves around. It's what it is. However, um, think about a plane. Are they the rudders or the flaps? I forget what they are on the, on the back of the wings that pitch up and then it lifts them up. Anyway, when you run into the wind, if you just do a slight few degree turn of the flaps, your head oncoming destruction propels you up. And that's what lifts are, right? That's what, the rudder flaps, I think they are. Yeah. My dad was a aerospace engineer, he'll be disappointed. <laughs> um, and then conversely is true. If your perspective is off kilter, that's going to throw you into the ground so fast. Throw so fast. Have you ever had something bad happen to you and your spirit's bad and you're like, I knew it was going to happen. It's because I did something last week and it's because I'm a piece of shit and it's going to keep going and it's going to happen. <laughs> and before you know, woo! That's not God. I promise you that's not God. You know, but conversely, the other thing that can happen. Have you ever been in the moods where like, wow, this is so cool this happened this way. It's not a big deal, but I can thank God for this today. I had no idea why that worked out. And God can percolate himself into your life for the small and the big throughout the entirety of it, leaving you with so much confirmation, affirmation, hand on your shoulder that you're just walking so fulfilled. I can't help but love someone and say, dude, I'm, my needs are so met. How are you today? And you're actually selfless in that zone. I know because I've been there, and I know because I haven't been there. And I know what it feels in my heart when I'm being selfish and torn up, and I can't even give someone a genuine how are you. You know, then other times I'm supernaturally filled up. I could care less about my finances, my anything, and I'm just present for that person. And I think that's how Jesus was when he hung out with him. Yes. You know, he was so radically filled with peace, so content that he just loved, as if he were the only person there on earth. Right. And uh, I've been with Christians. Pastor Bryce is one that makes me feel that way often when I speak with him. And you know it's God, you know, because no one's that cool, you know. <laughs> you are cool, but you know, a little supernatural help there too. But no, and this, this is all of our, this is all of our inheritance. This is what we get to look forward to growing in, to being peaceful through the ups and downs in life, to being, to being a stable uh, bastion for our family uh, during the ups and downs, and just like showing instead of just talking about it, walking it through them, helping them see, like, oh, I'll just level with you guys. And I went online. I have a lot of debt. 
I, I'm, I'm not really ashamed of it. I, I thought it through and went forward with education. I went to Columbia University. I have a lot of debt. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Do I have a major plan to pay it back? I absolutely do not. Yeah. Am I terribly worried about it? Not really. I'm not. There's not much I can do, but also supernaturally from God. I went down that path for a while. I went crazy. I'm like, why? Does it change? I'm still going to die. God is still here. It's fine. What are we doing? And so when people talk to me like, how are you not freaked out? I'm like, you tell me. I'm insane. Do you think I'm insane? Okay, I'm insane. Or maybe there's something you don't know about that I know in my heart. And then maybe you can chat with people about your experience, how you were freaked out, how God acts in your heart, and you can minister to people in your ways. They can see it. You know, they can just see how you're acting. Something strange. So, uh, so yeah, and it's just cool. I mean, I, I think one of my favorite verses in the Bible is just, ah, it's just so amazing. God makes all things work together for our good. Yes. Is that not worth boasting about? It, it blows my mind. It doesn't even make sense. It almost makes me as angry as it is hopeful. Because I'm like, how could you do that? No, I don't understand it. Uh, well, God, God works in apparent contradictions all the time. To be free, you give up your freedom. You know, to receive love, you give up. I mean, it's, it's all that way. He, he creates a path always through two extremes. Yeah. So no one's smart here, no one's smart here. You've got to just rely on God and go down the middle. It's never just this or this with God. It's, it's the path that you didn't see there, the path that he makes a way so that everyone has to point and say, oh, that was God. There's no other way that made sense. Huh. And there's been quite a few of those, and those are the best, you know. Um, so how do you say uh, and David showed us, too, uh, just refreshing himself in the Lord always, always just touched me. It's like, what is refreshing yourself in the Lord? It means that David, if you, you know, he is the, the most thorough biography in the Bible outside of Jesus, right? Um, he had so many ups and downs. He had so many amazing blessings, moments of crazy intimacy with God, only to go and do the most boneheaded thing over and over again, you know, from complete confidence and running with God, fearing nothing, to groveling in a cave, crying because people are talking about killing him. I mean, back and forth, back and forth. Check it out. But he said, uh, this, is a, this is something he dealt with a lot. You know, he was a man of ups and downs, immense victories and, and failures. And he said, uh, when I'm down, when I'm, when I'm distraught, I feel like I'm in a pit. You know, like an anxious pit. The people are like, you have no future, you have no hope, you're worthless. You're forgotten. You've got that, that nine. You might as well just kill yourself. It's cold, it's painful, you know. And uh, David constantly refreshes himself in the Lord. And that to me is, hey, my situation may not change. I get that. God doesn't always just go, poof, that's not a problem. It doesn't always work that way. But knowledge and experience of God resulting from refreshing, in, refreshing yourself in God, the knowledge and experience of God, the intimacy, the contact, will wash through you with calmness, relaxation, and peace beyond understanding. It's a promise in the Bible. It's a promise in the Bible. So don't run to the phone, run to the throne. Do you have a problem? Yes, you do. Maybe problems are just designed to force us to go to God. Maybe it's just to teach us, ouch, go to God, ouch, go to God, ouch. And then at the end, we will just go to God. And maybe that's how it trains us, you know. I know a lot of adults that still run to sex, or will run to Facebook, or run to this, or run to this, or run to this. Go buy something. And it's, it's, it's just endless, right? It's endless. Do you feel better after that? Usually not, you know. Usually not. So I just challenge you guys today, in the next week, in the next month, um, that the problems in our lives... They're, they're really just our lives. The ups and downs, they're normal lives. They're just lives. They're not bad about them. They're just what's in our lives. It's the content of our lives. The problems in our lives are not robbing us of joy. Yeah, come on. So, I mean, the problems in our life are not what's robbing us of joy. That's right. Our lack of intimacy with the Father yeah. and right. His promises is what's robbing us of joy. That's right. That's right. That's right. The lack of intimacy with the Father and His promises are what's robbing us of joy. It's kind of like, it's like a kid who, I don't know, uh, sorry if anyone actually dealt with this situation, just throwing this out, but like a problem teenager who never was raised by a father, never had a sense of self, never taught him what real masculinity was, hung out with gangs, and so he's got this whole perverted sense of what it is to be tough and macho. You know, it's, um, I totally forgot where I was going with that, guys. <laughs> it's going out there. But it's, uh, Okay. That's all right. Yeah, thanks guys, I appreciate it. 
So again, yeah. So joy is not from lack of problems. It's just from a lack of basically prioritizing God and realizing that's the, that's the solution to all of our problems. Place. It's a secret place. It's where we get refreshed. It's where our mind changes. It's where that touch comes and says, just chill out. I know. I know. The two greatest words that we'd ever wish God to tell us is just simply, I know. God, my dear, I know. I know. Yes. So I challenge you guys today. This week, examine your complaints. You know, my life is so rough because of this, or if you only knew what I'm dealing with, or my, my issues are here. Um, you know, examine your complaints in light of what the Lord might say if you were standing there right next to Him. Just have Him talk to you. Yeah, I hear you. Do you think that's a problem for me? Do you think that was unexpected? You know, I'm preaching to myself right now as much as you guys. You know, my emotions are certainly not constant. My emotions are dependent on chemicals in my brain, you know, what I ate, the sleep, the conversations I've had with people, um, random stuff, you know, whether or not my football team did well. Um, but as we discussed earlier, our attitudes and the will to control our attitudes can be constant. And we are empowered to take captive our thoughts. Um, I've learned that in times where I feel weakest, that just guessing every other way, uh, one time I decided to push into God when I felt weak, uh, running to Him in prayer like David did, um, checking your attitudes, pains, and resentments up against Him in prayer and with honest assessment of where you've been wrong. And, uh, exactly. And when I do that nine times out of ten, I find um, the attitudes are all gone. It's really hard for me to hold resentment against anyone, yeah. you know, because God says what I've done to him. Yeah. Mm, or C.S. Lewis says, the Christian is able to forgive the unexcusable in anyone else because the Lord has forgiven the unexcusable in him. That's right. We cannot hold any grudges against anyone, and we ought not, because you know what we forgiven? That's right. You don't, you don't want to, I want to be forgiven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amen. I like it. It's power in that. So let's just do it right now. Um, let's refresh ourselves in the Word, in the Lord. Let's see it. Uh, three other ones that pop out to me to get me, get me high and motivated in the morning. 2 Corinthians 10.5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Every lie. Every falsehood, every distraction. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Every thought you have, seriously, if it's painful, it might be good. But, but lift it up to God. Is this painful thought good to have? Okay, thank you, Lord. If it's not, throw it away. Get rid of it. If it's going to bring you down and corrupt you and destroy you, probably not from God. If He tells you, be on the lookout for it. <laughs> You're going to have issues with your thinking. It says it in the Bible. So to think you're not, you're going to lose. <laughs> you're going to lose. I mean, read, the, read the rules before you play the game. Yeah. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, uh -huh. sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing until it divides sword and soul and spirit, joints and marrow, as it judges the thoughts and purposes of the heart. That's terrifying. <laughs> That's incredibly powerful, too. Or Psalm 27, 1 to 4. The Lord is of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Through, though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Oh, I want that. Seriously. Do you guys understand how deeply engrossing that is? How much powerful confidence you would have to actually say that? There's an army against me and God's got my back. <laughs> Let's go. Let's walk out. I mean, this is, this is our inheritance now and in the future, guys. We may not feel this now, but we will feel this way if we continue to walk with God. That's an awesome promise. That's something I want. You know, I want to grow in strength. Um, this pumps me up. So, uh, how do you say? So, I just challenge you today, guys. If that's something you battle with, fighting with a lack of joy, I just pray for us to have a new motivation to go after the things of God. You know, to go after the promises of God. To learn that there's some strength and power and awesome emotions associated with simply understanding who God is. He says it's not just, oh, you learn about God, it's good. He goes, no, your life will be indelibly changed. You can never go back. Spend time with God in intimacy, learning, growing, thinking about Him, and you will never, ever be the same. Um, one sec here, guys. Let me check the time. 
Okay. So we, we all know that God is God is a solution. Spending time with God is really key, right? We all know this. We all know this. But I'll ask you, self audit, not to punish you, but let's be real. How much time do you spend with God? Yeah, that's always the answer. Yeah, in theory. No, but really, really, you don't have to answer, but only you know. Yeah. Only you know. And there's been periods in my life where I didn't at all. Periods in my life when I was a kid where I'd, oh yeah, I'd read a chapter, and now okay, I'm done with the chapter. Off, uh, yeah, and then my prayer life was, oh, I gotta pray before I go to sleep. Oh, Lord, bless, oh, I sleep on. Well. <laughs> and I was like, I pray, you know, good. And don't get me wrong, we all are children on a maturing path with God. We all have different ways that God talks to us, and He lights us. Oh, did you just do that, God? All different ways, and that's okay. And we're all on a path. I'm not trying to say the times of small times are bad or useless. No, perfectly fine. But just be honest with yourself, you know? John Piper, I don't know if you guys know him, he's, he's a Christian speaker, pretty famous. Uh, he goes, one of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from lack of time. <laughs> Read it again. One of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not due to lack of time. Absolutely. So is it possible, just throw it out there, church, so much stagnation in the church or lack of progress or breakthroughs in our own life or issues or lack of power that we've seen is due to this lack of obedience we have of pursuing God and treating Him as God as ultimately valuable, saying he's God, but then treating him less important than like your dog. The rebel, yeah. putting him on the back burner, you know. <laughs> You're totally God of everything when I get around to you, when I'm not bored, when I'm not tired, and when I'm not the one who's doing anything else. Woo! Tell God that in heaven. <laughs> Tell God that in heaven. Hey, Ryan, look, hey, God, how are you? Nice to meet you. So you could have had infinite joy to know me. You know, you could have, I had it right here. I said you could have spent time with me, had amazing blessings, amazing experience. Didn't that sound good to you, Ryan? And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. I, I was a little busy, though. You know, like I, it sounds really good, really good. That's not what you do to the creator of the universe. You know what I mean? I think he would be rightfully, I wouldn't say jealous or vindictive, but let's just say that's not a proper response to the, someone who offers you something like that. And don't get me wrong, much of my youth was very routine. Like I said, I didn't have any real love for God. I didn't have any real desire. I didn't see any, how do you say it? I didn't see any joy when I really was in the Word, you know? But I think maybe a lot of us uh, find ourselves on that path at the beginning. You know, don't know how to read the Bible. What's this all about? It's kind of boring. I'd rather read an action book. Um, but it's really about obedience. I think He honors the heart. I think if you say, you know what, I don't know how to do it, I can't read the Bible perfectly, but you say to do it, so I'll give it a whirl. I think that's the moment breakthroughs begin to happen in your heart and your mind. You read it with the author. That's right. When you read it with the Ooh, author. Oh, I like that too. It brings it alive. I like that too. I like that. So yeah, it all depends on the heart of what you're doing. If you're going through a routine thing, I'll just pray just because I have to get God to bless me reading the Bible. You're missing the entire point. You're acting like a little grumpy kid um, when you have infinite joy in front of you. Um, I even had a conversation with, uh, I hate to say it, a sister of mine, um, and she was talking about something and really had a kind of a weird attitude and was venting. And I said, hey, what does the Bible say about that? And you know when someone's not uh, walking with the Lord because they snap. You know, I wasn't trying to judge her. I was just being saying, hey, what's the Bible say about this? Oh, you don't need to tell me about the Bible. I read the Bible once in youth group. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, then you would know that the Bible doesn't tell you to read it once. It says, study the Word of God every day. Dwell on it. Have all the percepts in front of your brain all the time. Like a Jesus freak is what the standard is. Not to read it once, because then you sound like that. That's not how you do it. I'm not going to name names if you're watching. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, so Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Pretty clear. It doesn't say read the Bible once and forever hold your peace. It says make it a habit. Study it. Make it your fuel. Uh, understand that we as divinely created creatures in the image of the Most High are not made to run on garbage of sin. 
We don't buy a Ferrari and put low octane diesel in it. Yeah. You put Holy Ghost uh, jet fuel into it, and you make it you make it run well. Humans are not meant to run on sin, um, on sexual promiscuity, doubts, fears, insecurities, uh, COVID nineteen, uh, worrying about things that are unseen. Looking, <laughs> that's not where his strength comes from. You know, our strength comes from the Lord, our rock. That's where we get our confidence, you know. We run on Holy Ghost petrol. We don't run on garbage. We don't run on fears. Uh, we don't run on worldly ambition. We don't run on stock market volatility. Amen. We, don't, we don't run on what the world says we're valuable for. We, we run on what God says uh, is important. And we are infinitely valuable to Him because He gave His Son for us. So... Don't forget that. Yeah, That's a great, great price. Yeah, so Priceless. don't forget that. Um, then wrapping up, I wanted to say a few things about wrestling with God uh, in that you can understand Him and know Him more. That you certainly should not shy away from it. I don't think you should. Uh, I used to personally feel bad whenever I kind of, I guess, had a disagreement with God or felt that I didn't come to the same understanding on something or I think it's okay to do something and He didn't. Um, but like anything in life, well, yeah, obviously, you're going to know who's going to win that one. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. But, uh, but it's like any relationship on earth. The quality is not really determined by the frequency of fights. It's really about how you decide to work through your fights and carry it on into the future. So even with your spouse or something, oh, we never fight. Oh, you guys are crazy. Get out of here. But those people that do fight and commit to making it through the other end with peace and understanding, that's the predication of a successful marriage, you know, being able to go through it, right? Um, and so with God, too, I don't think he's offended at your doubts. I don't think he's worried about your lack of faith. I don't think his sense of royalty, honor, or value is in any way threatened by your questioning him. I think he's perfectly comfortable with that. So if you have conflicts with your faith, have honest disputes with God. Work out your faith with fear and trembling. It says to do it. God can handle your logic. He gave it to you. That's right. You know? Either you're right and God is wrong, or you are wrong and God's right. And I trust him to make either way work out. So, and uh, the big one for me was uh, humility is a big deal when my arguments with God. I demand to know this. I want to know this. Uh, Lord, I want... And he's just silent sometimes. And I just get to deal with it. And other times, he shows me. He puts something in my heart. He gives me the ideas and says, oh, some things are meant to be known, some are not. Even it says in the Bible, like some things, I forget what the verse is, some things are not made to be known. If they're secret, just leave it. You're not, I don't know, like your head could even blow up if we're not ready to handle that stuff. Yeah. You know, we might have to be strengthened to even understand some of these answers. Um, so yeah, and this, yeah, it's just, it just commission the, the don't be afraid to bring up your honest concerns with God or what he says is right or I think this should be okay. Or, uh, why do you create us an innate desire to have sex but we're not supposed to do it? I'm angry with you. You know, a lot of youth are really angry at God this way. I have been, you know. Uh, but uh, Philippians 2.12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I always took that up. It, it doesn't mean to do works. It means read up on the things that confuse you. Talk to other believers to clarify issues you have. Um, if you're having issues with sin or theology that's not working out or making sense in your actual life, get to the root of it. Discover it. Hunt it. Fight it. Be hungry. Um, be humble and be willing to learn and submit to something mightier than yourself. Um, C.S. Lewis always says, if, if you're haughty and you're confident that you're good in the world and you're pretty happy, you're, you're busy looking down at everyone and everything. And so long as you're doing this, how can, you do, how can you look up? You can't look up at God when you're looking down on everyone else, right? It's impossible. So real growth experiences always, always involve struggle and pain. Think about it in your life. Think about financially. Think about in a relationship. As a teenager, playing sports, holding your first job, whatever it is, real growth experiences always involve struggle and pain. And submission to God, I found, is one of them. He is so much bigger, so much stronger, so much more right than me, so much more logical than me, more patient than me, more worthy than me, more deserving than me, more holy than me, and I owe him more than I could ever, ever be owed here. Jacob showed us a good way to deal with this. <laughs> Jacob was at his wit's end. 
Uh, he was running from his past at one point and anxious about being destroyed when he was going to meet Esau the following day, a brother who he basically defrauded years before. Um, he sent everything he owned ahead of him as a gift to his brother in hopes that his brother wouldn't kill him. In other words, he was terrified. Jacob was a schemer. He was smart. He was very good at what he did up to that point. Uh, he, he, allotted, he had lots of herds and wives and this and was successful. But basically, um, God took away everything he had and left him very, very scared. And then he had an epic wrestling match with an angel, if you guys remember this. Uh, Genesis 32, 24 says, When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the angel said, or then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So what does that mean? Uh, Jacob was a deceiver. That's what his name meant. Afterwards, the name Israel meant to struggle or wrestle with God. Jacob was forced to see finally that he absolutely could not do it on his own that he found himself in desperate need of a lifeline, completely broken down, and the Lord was there to meet him, to teach him, uh, teach him his new identity, and to let him know that his new walk with God was only beginning. And I think all of us as Christians have to get to that point, I know I did, where no matter what you try, no matter what you commit, no matter how hard you try, you're going to fail yourself, you're going to fail people around you, you're going to fail God, and you're going to see that your goodness and your energy was only ever provided to you from God to steward in the first place. So, that being said, I uh, just wanted to review a few things before we close. God does tell us to boast, but to boast for the right reasons in our knowledge and understanding of God. We do have the capacity and strength to be joyful in all circumstances. Work on that. Get that out of your mind that life is hard so it can't be joyful. That's a lie. That's a lie. We can be joyful. We have to use the knowledge of God to fight and develop and practice a proper God perspective about the issues, about what he says, how to go to him, how to deal with them. Look at David. Look at Jacob. Look at examples in the Bible that will basically allow us to not be confused and see where we need to go. Uh, spend time with God in prayer, in Bible study. Um, even pretend that you love doing it, and you might find that you love doing it, you know, but obedience is exceedingly important. I mean, if we're not doing the basic things the Bible suggests, well, we ought not be surprised if things are not turning out the way we hoped. Um, and finally, wrestle with God. Become intimate with Him. Contact. Work out your faith with fear and trembling. Don't be afraid. Get in there. Contact. Wrestle Him. And watch God grow in us in the fruits of the Spirit. And watch people in your life call you out as having seen change in your life. As having seen evidence of God's fruits of the Spirit coming out of you. Because it will. Um, and so again, uh, again, it was, all, it was on my heart that I'd be re remiss to not bringing up. Bring this up again. God is holy. It's the He's conceptually the most holy thing we could ever imagine. He's more deserving of praise than we could ever give if we were in nothing but exuberant praise our entire life, right? He's royal. It's, we can't even... We would be blown away if we were in His presence, right? Um, and He extends these amazing offers and promises to us in His Word. And again, what we do with it is extremely and eternally important. And that choice is yours today, what you do with it whether you read more about it, whether you pursue it, or whether you just walk away from it. Um, but Jesus died to give us this. That's right. it, it wasn't free. So let's uh, close our eyes and pray, please. Ah, oh, Lord, we just ask right now that you, you start, a, start a new zeal in us for you, uh, for your promises, uh, for who we can become in you, for what it is to walk in our destiny of being one with the creator of the universe.
and intimacy and understanding and knowing you, Father. We pray that the spirit of lukewarmness, of apathy, of not caring, of, of oh, it's too hard, if something else is better in this life, uh, to be bound in the name of Jesus, Lord God, then the lie will not take root in our heart, Father, but instead, the seeds of wisdom that you shared today through us will, will percolate down and get to the, to the fertile regions in our heart and the soil, Lord God, and you will water it and you will fertilize it and you will bring it up and uh, do a good work in us, Father. So bless us today. Um, um, help us to be safe as we go about our week and minister to us and help us to grow closer, Father, to you, more reliant, more joyful, and to realize the exceptional happiness and joy that we do have as your children. Amen. 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 Pastor.